Hey folks, I'm Gene Della Sala with Audioholics. We are live. It is July 19th, 11 p.m. Eastern Time. We've got two special guests with us. We're going to be talking about loudspeakers, all of these great tower speakers we reviewed this year. We got Matthew Pose, and now we have James Larson. How are you guys doing today? Hey, yeah, so it's good to be here, and I'm glad I was able to pull my friend James out so that everybody could get to meet him. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm James Larson. And the speaker reviewer guy for Audioholics. You know, James, it's funny. I was just, I was just te uh, saying this before. You've been writing for Audioholics for probably at least five years, and I don't. I think this is the first time we've actually seen each other and actually talked to each other on a call. Uh yeah. We just. I mean, I've talked with you a whole lot, but only through email. So <laughs> this is like the first time we've actually. I've talked to Gene like live. So this is a. Uh, I guess new for everyone. So, awesome. hi, Gene. <laughs> How you doing, my friend? Well, I want to tell you guys. Um, I want to step back a little bit. James has been doing a ton of loudspeaker reviews for us uh, over the last couple of years, and he's been doing a lot of subwoofer reviews. I'm sure everybody that's on this channel now appreciates and has seen that. I want to show you guys um, what's involved and what James, what I had James doing for us and why it's so cool, especially in this day and age when we're like one of the last publications that are actually objectively measuring and analyzing components for audio, for consumer audio. I do all the amplifier and receiver measurements. James does all the loudspeakers and subwoofers. Matthew's kind of our acoustics guy. He's getting involved. He's doing some tech stuff. We're working on different standards and all this other stuff that you're going to be seeing soon. So it's really cool. It's an exciting time for Audioholics. We're keeping the science in audio, even though the rest of the industry is kind of moving away from that. We're sticking to our roots. So I'm going to uh, share my screen real quick with you guys. Um, I just want to confirm that you can see what I'm seeing right now. Yeah, we can see you all right. Okay. So here... Here are these five towers that uh, James has reviewed, and I think Matt, you've listened to at least one or two of these towers by now. So let me. Yeah, I've actually me... listened to two of them. Okay, so right here on the left, we've got the BMW uh, 603. This is their latest generation with the with their new driver technology that's based on the 800 series trickle down technology into this speaker. This is a three way design. We've got the Klipsch. Is it the RP 8000F? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so this is a two and a half way design with dual eight inch woofers and a, um, a horn tweeter. It's it's just a two way design. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was a two and a half way. Okay, so then we also have the SVS. This is their new Prime Pinnacle uh, speaker. This is a three way design. It's got three base drivers, six and a half inch drivers. I think that's a five and a quarter inch mid, right? Yeah, three three six point fives, a one inch dome tweeter, and a five point two five mid. Cool. Then we've got the RBH R55E, and this is an MTM. So you got two. This is the only one out of the five that has dual mid ranges in an MTM kind of fashion. And then you got the three six and a half inch aluminum uh, drivers. Yeah, that that's that's correct. Yeah. And then finally, it's the well, I don't remember the name of the paradigm model. Is it the Premier 800 or? It's the Premier 800F. Thank you. So this is a three-way design. This has a very specialized kind of phase plug cover on the mid-range. And I think it's got a bigger mid-range than the other ones. Am I correct on that? It's got a 6.5-inch mid-range driver. 6.5, OK. So I wanted to, these are the speakers we're going to be talking about. I wanted to show you guys what James is involved when he does these measurements. He doesn't just stick the speaker in a room and measure it like you, you might see with some, you know, some of the forums and some of the magazines that do reviews. We actually take this very seriously. We try to get as close to anechoic as possible. So you take the room out of the equation. So what James and Matt have done is they've they worked on building this platform. Uh, James, it puts the speaker, what, 30 feet up in the air? No, not, not 30. That <laughs> platform uh, raises the speaker to about like a bit over four feet, um, which is like, which wait, where, I, where I raise the microphone like at like, 7.5 feet that gives me about when i when i gate out the ground reflections it gives me like good resolution down to say 200 hertz so i get like basically anechoic down to 200 hertz 
Gotcha. I don't know why I thought 30 feet for some reason. Oh, it's probably because I've done some testing up that high with other, with poles, but uh, James actually has two, now you have two rigs that you actually use. So one you use for bookshelves. So that one goes higher. Yeah. That one goes up like 12 feet, is it? Well, about like, uh, uh, not not 12 feet, Um, about, it, it, it elevates the tweeter to about, no, of, of a normal bookshelf speaker to like about, I want to say like 10, 10 feet-ish, 9 feet-ish. Right, but that that gives me very good um, like uh, like anechoic resolution down to say uh, like almost two hundred hertz again, you know. So so since the mic is at the same height, you know. Gotcha. Okay, so now here's the prime pinnacle. By the way, you take awesome pictures, man. That's a beautiful picture. Oh, uh, that's just documenting the uh, the the process. I mean, what, for these pictures, what I. I'd like to get the like, bring out better is you can see the microphone, right? It's hard to see it in the trees. It's almost like hidden, right? But yeah. th that rod on the um on the left side of the picture, the, the microphone is aimed at the speaker. That's I'm just trying to get the point of the, the testing conditions across, you know. So understood. Um, understood. So I guess one question um I, at least I have, and maybe the viewers have, is why not why go through the uh pain of of elevating the speaker? Why not? Just uh, take the speaker, do a ground plane measurement like you do with subwoofers and, and try to get an accurate response there. Is that something that's even achievable or is it because you're trying to do multiple angles and you're trying to get the best um, power response? Okay, yeah, well, um, you could just measure the speaker. Like I could have like the speaker resting on the ground and have the mic like point at the speaker. But if this, but um. The closer to the ground we get with the microphone, um, the worse the resolution um, gets for like low frequencies. So like the ground bounce, like the cl the closer the microphone is to the to the ground, um, the quicker the the acoustic reflect reflection from the ground hits the microphone. And like if I measured like if I just had the speaker sitting on the ground or in a room or something, I wouldn't get anything probably below anything usable. Um, below one kilohertz and like what good is that so like um yeah yeah well no i understand I, i've i've experimented with that and i've had my own trouble so i kind of abandoned that that's why i was just wanted to get the audience to understand that as well yeah the other thing is that james um has done he does ground plane measurements to do low frequencies and he and i have done this um so if you actually lay the speaker on the ground and place the microphone on the ground like you do for the subwoofer testing you can you you avoid the ground bounce because it's essentially instant, but it ends up becoming half pie space. So you end up with uh, re base reinforcement. And then James and I have had resolution problems where the frequency response doesn't appear, it doesn't match basically the free space. And so while that is considered an accurate approach, James verified his approach with Harman using free space, but the ground plane approach hadn't been verified. And given the discrepancies we saw, I know you, you've discouraged doing that more. Um. Well, as, as far as ground, okay, we do ground plane testing to get the base response, and and uh, it doesn't really work for trouble too well. Um, so like, I, I can capture pretty well below, below one kilohertz, you know, maybe a little bit less than that. And and the reason why I guess I should explain to the audience, like, I can place the microphone directly on the ground, and and, and get that base response because there is no ground reflection when the microphone is on the ground itself. It's not like like uh, the acoustic reflection is not bouncing up back into the mic because the microphone is right on the ground. It is the ground. So like I'm yeah. measuring from the grounds, like my point of view, basically. Well, one thing I, I Matt, you hit on a very important point. Um, we've calibrated James's test procedure with, with the NR, with, not with the NRC, with Harman's anechoic lab. So in other words, Harman sent us a couple of speakers to measure and then they compare their res our results with their anechoic results that they have in their chamber. And we've kind of calibrated our test procedures. So we know what we're testing above a couple of hundred hertz for these speakers is very accurate. And then if you want accurate bass below the 200 hertz, you could do the ground plane method that he's talking about like we do for subwoofers. Sometimes you could splice those two together or you just show those as separate graphs. Yeah, one point about that, I don't splice them together. Most people do. I don't. Un, un, that was actually under advisement from uh, Floyd Tool. And uh, the reason why is because, because we're using two different measurement methods, right? There's no way to get them 
to match accurately. They're just they're right. just not. So like I could spice them together, but it would be kind of like um almost like a deception. I mean, that might be a little bit of a strong word for it, but it's not if I, you know, it, it just, uh, they don't quite match 100%. So I, I don't want to like, um, I want to get the most accurate information out there. As, like, yeah, we don't possible. want, we don't want fake news. That's the bottom line. We don't want fake news. We're trying to promote truth and science here. So yeah. I'm sorry if we've kind of dived off or we kind of went off on a tangent here. I just wanted to kind of go over that measurement procedure. I think that's important. I think the first speaker we should look at is the, uh, Bowers and Wilkins, uh, 603. And, uh, the retail on these, I believe was 1800 a pair, James. Yes. 1800 a pair. Okay. So this is the speaker that has, this is the three-way design. It has a, is it a, what is it called? A continuum, uh, driver or something like that. The material they use on the mid range. Yeah. The cone, the mid range cone is called, is made out of something called continuum. Um, you know, they used to use Kevlar. This continuum stuff, it looks a lot like Kevlar. It's a woven, it's a very, the, the, the weave, it's a fabric. The weave is pretty visible, so it's like Kevlar, but it, it's, it's finer and, um, it's supposedly better. It's supposedly, you know? I think it's a little yeah. stiffer. I mean, I, I went to their facility when they were introduced the 800 series and I was playing around with their cone materials. I never was a big fan of Kevlar, to be honest with you. I always thought Kevlar kind of sounded a little colored um, in their, at least in their speakers. So when I heard their newer cone technology and their newer speakers, I just thought that they sounded a lot better to me. Um, I'm sure they measure better because they showed us the FEA analysis on these drivers and the breakup modes are a lot higher than their older drivers, which is good because now you could use these drivers at higher bandwidth than you could before. But that said, there's nobody doubting that the driver technology and the, and the elements used in the speaker are top notch. As you noted in your review, the build quality is probably among the best out of all the speakers in this particular model. Would you agree? I would say the like the cabinet construction is the most like it's the most solid. Um, it's it's like it really is. It's it's the smallest of them, like in, in volume area, right? But it's still the heaviest. So like um. It's a pretty heavy duty speaker. Yeah. Very inert. Oh yes, very much so. So yeah, I love your pictures, man. You take really good pictures. Um, so there's a little plinth here, uh, you know, instead of just using spikes, they have a little base to stabilize the speaker, which I think is cool. It looks pretty well, neat. They use spikes to under the plinth. Actually, right. actually you, well, for those you can use these, you can choose between these like rubber ball things, like half hemisphere of like, rubber ball. Uh, thing feet right or, or spiked feet and it's so like but the spiked feet wow they're really spiky you know i mean if you they're they're like they look like the like arrowheads you know or something like that they're yeah they're they're not you don't want to put those on like a hardwood floor or anything like that they will really or, yeah you put some pennies under it or something if you're going to do that i really like the way james just described that the spikes are really spiky yeah <laughs> You're sorry. <laughs> very good uh, adjectives there. So um, talk about the measurements um, before we talk about the sound. I'm looking at this measurement here and and it's kind of shocking to be honest with you to see a speaker of this caliber uh, done with engineering of this caliber because there's a lot of PhDs at this company. So they know how to make a speaker. They know the math. They know the science. But what kind of concerns me is this huge dip you see at two kilohertz. And you're not supposed to see that because the idea when you make, at least according to Harman's research and according to many companies follow the research, is you want you know the best amplitude response, the most linear amplitude response, and then you want your off-axis response you know, to taper off at higher frequencies, but to match the on-axis response as closely as you can so you can pre uh, preserve the early reflections. But when you look at a speaker like this at around two kilohertz, you see this suck out and then obviously a little bit rise above here. Why is that happening? Maybe Matt can explain it because I look at this and I say this, they must have messed up the design. But the question is, did they mess up the design or did they design under a different design goal? Yeah, it's 
it, so the answer is they designed under a different design goal. This speaker measures the way it's supposed to based on what they're prioritizing. And I can't speak for them. So I'm going to speak for what I believe is their approach and why that they're doing this based on things they've said in the past and the fact that all their speakers, for the most part, have the same design. So it uses a first order crossover on the tweeter. Now, a lot of uh, consumers who are not very familiar with crossover design um, either have no idea what I just said, or they tend to respond with, oh yeah, first orders are better because they're simpler and there's less in the signal path. There's actually a different reason why, which is that essentially for every order that you go higher, first order, second order, third order, fourth order, you cascade what are called all pass filters. And it causes a shift in phase. And so once you get past first order, you start to get shifts that cause it so that the speaker messes up the phase of the signal that transfers through. Now, all speakers do this to varying degrees and some much worse than others. The room does it too. There's an argument that this is not particularly audible. That's the view I take. I believe that's the, the view that Harman has taken in their speaker designs. Uh, but BMW actually takes the opposite view and makes that a priority. So by using a first order crossover, they're ensuring what's referred to as a transient perfect speaker. Now, my guess, because we didn't actually measure this since it isn't something that we consider to be important in measurements, is that the speaker probably does have better transient performance than others. And, and the joke that I would say is it probably can come close to passing a perfect square wave, which shows good phase coherence. Uh, it probably still isn't perfect, though. And I, again, I would argue that even though that might be an ideal uh, to be able to do that, that it's it's actually focusing on the wrong thing for sound quality. So uh, the takeaway here is what you see there is a result of an intentional engineering approach, but I personally don't happen to think it's the right compromise to make. Well, I have two questions for you, Matt, on that. And you said you basically were saying that the first order crossover is the only way to get you know the the best transient or phase coherence. Well, what about I thought. That's what Linkwitz Riley crossovers do, you know, fourth order Linkwitz Riley. I thought you can still get close to a perfect phase coherence. And now you have the advantage of a steeper crossover so you increase your power handling and you don't have to worry about the out of band signals where the tweeter can't produce those frequencies. It's way down in the mud as opposed to it wasting power and, and, and trying to achieve hitting those uh, lower frequencies and causing more distortion. Yeah, so the issue becomes that there's a difference between having that perfect time phase relationship and having good phase integration. So with a properly done Linkwitz Riley fourth order crossover, you have good phase integration, which allows for good amplitude response. Uh, but you still have four all pass filters cascaded together. So you still have the problem that the phase has been shifted by those four fil filters. But doesn't that phase come back in alignment? And if it, if it, everything agrees in amplitude response, it should be all good. So I, I don't know if it, I... It still wouldn't be time aligned. So a, a Linkwitz Riley speaker can't pass a square wave to use that simple test. It's not a transient perfect speaker. If okay. you then re-time aligned everything, uh, yes, it would be able to do that. But almost no speaker is. The only speakers that tend to be that way are things like people probably remember, like Teal, that use the sloped front baffle. Now, they right. also often use first order crossovers to make a transient perfect speaker. The other option, of course, is active. And we just did a video recently talking about that. So you can create this using DSP. And that's actually the better way to do it. Well, the other problem with doing a slanted baffle is now you're listening to those drivers off axis. Right. Yeah, it's actually uh, these are all essentially physical analog ways of fixing this problem. There's, I suppose, one other approach is speakers that use a, like a just a full range driver just one driver there's no crossover yeah right so okay. full range speakers are transient perfect they would always pass a square wave for the most part you can also typically do this with a first order filter and a uh, uh coaxial so that that is an old approach that some companies have done uh again though i think all of this is is um a solution for a problem that doesn't really matter yeah then when you do a typical coaxial driver like that with a first order crossover now you're using a tweeter with a smaller motor structure usually usually a neodymium and now you're designing a speaker that has limited dynamic range um for coaxials uh no you you can get you can mount like a heavy duty compression driver in the back of like a one of these coaxial drivers so the motor can be really really you know, yeah but you typically don't see that in consumer audio you know i'm talking about like this stuff. sure yeah and I you, think lose, actually, you lose sensitivity seeing... too i mean i've seen most of the coaxial designs like the elax for example they're usually three or four db less sensitive than conventional two-way designs uh, okay yeah well i don't know 
that much about the elax but when, when you when we talk about like uh, coaxials I'm, I'm more thinking of like tannoy right or like um that sort of thing where like they, they use the the like the the mid-range driver that the tweeter is mounted in is like a, almost like a horn or a waveguide right right and that actually tends to have higher sensitivity and they, they usually use compression drivers for those type of things yeah i mean i guess there's always exceptions to the rule i mean i'm just kind of looking at like when i look at stuff like calf or elac i just notice that those speakers tend to have lower sensitivity than conventional counterparts in their price points i mean so i like i just think that maybe there's a trade-off there when you're trying to design system dynamics versus getting something that's perfectly phase coherent yeah uh, i guess my mind when you say, when we say coaxial my mind goes to like for some reason more like um higher powered speakers like yeah you, well you're you, like you're, a jtr guy or you're, you're thinking of like these giant commercial grade kind of speakers i i know where you're going because you're 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 going into all these crazy designs you like big powerful speakers too yeah well actually coaxials have been more um not that not get too far off topic um from the uh, the subject under discussion but coaxials like historically um they've tended to be more more powerful now th these new speakers like the the like elac and like well the, the, the speakers andrew jones has been involved in basically you know the the uniq driver from kef and elac and pioneer um that's like that's not quite what i think of or i guess that's not as common or it's more recently become a more of a thing thanks to um andrew jones but that's historically not how like these crack seal drivers have kind of been made okay i got you so again we're looking at back to the bmw um it does not oh. have the most flattering frequency response oh gene say. yes a uh, one point i want to make about this okay yeah the the, the frequency the on axis frequency response is not that good i mean well not not that neutral okay um and i think it's a little bit it's definitely kind of sibilant and a little harsh on axis but if you go like 25 30 degrees off axis it actually flattens out a lot and it's it's a it's not a bad response and i think um so like that's that's kind of where you'd be sitting if you were sitting in the center of these speakers um and and the speakers were pointing straight forward in like a parallel direction then um you would be sitting at a at a point where they would have actually a, a flattish response and they don't sound bad at all in fact i think they sounded pretty good you know when you set them up right you know i think these speakers are a little bit more fussier about placement and like um and uh toe in like angles and stuff like that so like um th there is that to consider too yeah like you look at this 3d plot and you could see like you said around 20 degrees right yeah like 20 20 to 30 or so so it flattens yeah it definitely flattens out a little bit here so this speaker guys this speaker is definitely more placement finicky than some of the other ones in the in the uh comparison so james maybe um with that being said we looked at the measurements and you talked about the placement considerations maybe give us a one or two sentence summary of of how you thought these speakers sounded how was the bass performance how was the uh you know the tonality and how do they image that kind of stuff and what was your overall impression of the speaker sure yeah you want me to sum up the speaker um i would say that when you when you place them right so that you're uh, like at a 25 degree angle about um they sound really good. I think they sounded pretty tonally balanced, maybe a little bit brighter because um, there, there's still like a little bit of like upper mid range energy there that might be just a little bit above the rest of the range, but they sound pretty good. And actually the bass response is, is, is very good. I mean, these things are, they're tuned very deeply. And um, if you use, if you put them up against your walls to like bass load them, they have, I think of all the speakers in this like roundup, they're perceptually the deepest digging speakers. I mean, they're they're solid down into the twenties. I mean, the twenty hertz range. So like um, um, the they're in least in need of a subwoofer at least if you're not really cranking the bass hard. Wow, and I'm surprised to hear that, especially since you had a clip speaker in the mix. They're usually, clips are kind of bass intensive speakers. So um, I have I have the article. We haven't posted this yet. I'm going to be posting this tonight. I just wanted to go over some of the specs on these different speakers. We have a spec table. If you guys click on the spec tab here, try to show you best we can. 
So the BMWs, the sensitivity on them was 88.5 dB with 2.83 volts at one meter. Did you measure about that? Was that a pretty conservative or pretty accurate sensitivity rating? Well, it's been a little while since I've, I measured these. I don't I don't remember every single spec. Yeah, we'll have to listen to that I measured, But I think that BMWs might have been a little bit little bit lower than their measured. I mean, the, the measured... Um, the way I measure sensitivity might have been a little bit lower than what they spec'd, right? But like, right. It, it would be like maybe a couple decibel difference. It's not really a big deal. Yeah, well, guys, just just so you know, when we measure sensitivity of a speaker, we do it per IEC standard, which is from was it three hundred hertz to three kilohertz. I, I go a little bit beyond that, so like I don't quite. I think it's like okay, yeah, three. There's that's the standard. Yeah, but I think that there is other. Other frequencies are also important for that, and like so, like I don't, I know I consider other other frequencies outside of that range. Yeah, understood. Um, there are something you have to consider when you look at sensitivity specs on loudspeakers. You have to see how they're specking that, because in some cases they don't really tell you if they're doing it free space or if they're doing it in eighth space. Different kind of loading will change the sensitivity, at least at the lower frequencies. And if they don't bandwidth limit it then a speaker will have an oversensitive rating in their spec sheet as opposed to what you, what we measure, which is more of a standard way of measuring uh, sensitivity. Hey, um, one thing about this uh, sensitivity specs, Gene, is like of all the specs that loudspeaker manufacturers like post, that's the one I would least trust. I mean, there, there's, yeah, especially if they don't say how, the, the method that they're using to measure sensitivity that it's just I wouldn't take it seriously you just have to kind of kind of go by the design instead of you can test you know giving any credence to the the sensitivity spec at all except yeah, and I would I, I would say out of the five speakers in this comparison I would just guessing I didn't look at the review but I'm just guessing Klipsch is probably the one that overstated sensitivity more than the others y yeah no, there's no doubt about that um <laughs> It's like it's a sensitive speaker. They, they, I don't know why they do it. They don't need to, and they shouldn't do it. But they they have their own way of like g gauging sensitivity, and it it uh it 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 it's not comparable to any other, you know, not comparable to the way other people measure the sensitivity of, of loudspeakers. So yeah, anytime I've measured a clip speaker in the past, it's always come out four to six dB um, lower sensitivity than clip publishes. But that said, it's still a pretty damn efficient speaker, and they, you know, they play, they rock with very little power. But again, the, the sensitivity rating is questionable. They don't even say they do it in free space. In fact, I think when we pressed them once, they said some type of eight space thing. I don't even re remember the actual particulars of that. But yeah, it was some kind of like in room kind of like um, I want like a uh, adjusted sensitivity. It's it's like it's like like eighth space, I, I don't think this is exactly that, but they had some kind of formula that they they use for for sensitivity measurements. It was it was way above what most people do. It, it it's not they they don't need to do it. I don't know why they do it. They, their speakers are perfectly fine. Right. It's interesting. Last thing about the BMWs. It's interesting. You said you felt perceptually they had the deepest bass, but they uh, on the spec sheet they don't. They go you know their three dB point is forty eight hertz, whereas some of the other speakers in this roundup, particularly the SVS's 3 dB point is 29 hertz, and I think the RBH one is around 30 hertz. So I'm kind of surprised to hear that, but I did hear some of newer BMW towers, and they definitely have more bass than their older generation stuff, which is a welcome thing in my viewpoint. One thing I would say about the, like, I'm a little hesitant. Like, I, I, as with the sensitivity measurements, you can't really trust the frequency response too much too, especially those, those like negative, Three or plus or minus three dB windows, or negative six or negative ten, because like all of these speakers, all of them have like a tapered bass response. They go out to about like maybe eighty hertz, ninety hertz, or something. They start rolling off, and um, and there's a good reason why they do that. So like, if you if you took it literally, they, the lot of these wouldn't quite get in that window because of the the, the tapered bass response, and then they go down. They have a gradual slope in bass response. And then they they really start dropping off below their tuning point. So like, so the, the 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 negative the low end of that window I wouldn't take seriously. Gotcha. Okay. Well, let's look at the next speaker we were going to talk about the Klipsch RP eight thousand F. Yeah. 
a pretty speaker. I mean, I like the gold drivers. I really, ever since Klipsch went to that, I think that's, you know, that adds a lot of appeal to keeping the grills off and showing off what you got here. Um, yeah. These look like these look like the physically the most opposing towers out of the bunch. Yeah, those actually were one of the ones that James brought over to my house to listen to, and I had a good chance to listen to them for a little while in my room. Uh, and one of the things I commented on was that they were among the most attractive clip speakers that I had seen in a while. Uh, and, and I'll say they're one of those speakers, they look better from a distance than they do up close, but the reality is typically that's how they are looked at too. So I applaud them for finding inexpensive ways to make an attractive speaker. That gloss finish was great. And the trim rings they put around the woofer to hide the screws, that was also really nice. It's a, it's a sharp speaker. Yeah, I like I like the finish. It looks really, you know, the radius edges are nice. I mean, it's just, it's a nice design. It's not the bulky box that you're used to seeing from Klipsch. Um, the measurements, I, I look at this frequency response curve, I'm like, really, this is a clip? I expected to see, you know, a rise in frequency response above seven or eight kilohertz. And this thing looks very linear to me. Um, you guys want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, I was like, okay, historically, Eclipse like, has been known for being a little bit bright and having a rise in the treble. Um, I think with this uh, newer generation, I think it's been out since 2015, the reference premiere series, right? They've kind of they they're aiming for a uh, neutral response, so like just flat, accurate um, frequency response, and you can see they they have achieved it. I mean, uh, I talked to their engineers, and um, yeah, they, they don't really go. I guess at least with the reference premiere series, they they don't seem to go for like the elevated treble anymore, and that's that's welcome for me. For me, that's welcome. I mean, I I I, I prefer a more neutral voicing, you know. I mean, I could I could understand how people like some people like hot or trouble, but for me, like either neutral or maybe a bit warmer rather than hotter. Well, it's and, a it's a beautiful speaker uh, measurement wise, and I think this is the cheapest of the bunch. I think there are twelve hundred a pair in in the black finish, and then fifteen hundred a pair in gloss, right? Yeah, that's amazing. That these are like it's a, it's a pretty nice. I mean, it's not the most highest end gloss finish, but it's actually pretty good, and. They're fifteen hundred a pair for like a, a really, you know, a, a a neutral speaker that looks nice. And um, I, I don't know how they do it, but they do. I guess by going just with a two-way design, and the the horn really helps there. That they avoid the complexity and extra costs of three-way designs, and like um, they manage to do it. So it's like a really good, relatively inexpensive speaker. Um, I was uh, pleasantly surprised by these. So, like, yeah, and and like, okay, the the gloss black is fifteen hundred, as you said. The regular, I think it's like a black oak, or the regular the regular finish is like twelve hundred, and and you find and you can find those on sale pretty frequently. So you can get them close to a thousand dollars a pair, and like, that's like a phenomenal speaker. It's a really good deal, you know, for for what they can do. These are powerful, neutral speakers that are really pretty well behaved. For like a thousand a pair it's just not even fair to the rest of the speakers be you know but you know they are big speakers though that's one thing we have to say they're big and also the bass is like it's not as tapered with respect to the uh rest of the speakers so it's easy to get too much bass with these if you place them too close to the walls or something like that the the bass really um it it, it punches you know so can you plug that port? I know it's like an it's an oval it's a, a rectangular port. It's not a simple um, circular port. So can you just plug that port with a, with a couple of socks or something if you got too much loading into the room? So I actually did that when I was doing uh, my uh, Axbona uh, uh, presentation. I had to do a test case, and I used those clip speakers for the test case. And I was having issues with bass integration and flatness in the room. And so I decided to try stuffing the port. And so, yeah, it's a Tractrix shape, I think they say, and it's got sort of a rectangular slot look to it. So what I ended up doing was just taking some cotton insulation I had and shoving it in there. So for those who are kind of curious about like, does that work? Now, you could totally plug it. But what I did actually provided a sort of a periodic like port. It, it allowed a little bit of air and sound to pass through. Uh, but it dramatically reduced it. And as a result, I did get a flatter response in the room. And I actually thought the base was more neutral. And I have a very tight sealed room. So that is a common problem for me. 
Wow. Well, I'm glad to hear that the, the speaker is way more neutral than prior Klipsch models because I've had problems with, with, at least with the inexpensive, not really the Palladiums or any, or, or the older uh, really high-end speakers, but the general $1,000 Klipsch speakers from like 10 years ago, I just, I couldn't listen to them. They were just too bright for me. So, and they didn't measure like this. So someone at Klipsch is doing some math. They're doing some math on that horn. They're controlling the resonances inside that horn and they're just, you know, they're paying attention and, and they're doing it right. I'm glad to see that. Yeah, there's actually kind of a funny story to this. I also have not had good experiences with Klipsch speakers in the past. Um, I've generally found that they are too bright for my taste and, and there are issues with the response. And so when James told me he was getting these, I was really hating on them. And he said, Matt, no, you got to check them. I'm telling you, they're good. And uh, he brought them over and I was just right up to the moment that we had them plugged in and I listened. I was I was teasing him about how bad they were going to sound. And I honestly was shocked. I mean, they were it was beyond pleasantly surprised. They really are a good speaker. So how would you set these up in a room? Um, either of you guys, would you would you do any towing at all? Uh, assuming that that's that the person's in the money seat, they're in the sweet spot. Would you use moderate towing or would you uh, fire them straight ahead? Uh, for these, for the most neutral response, um, I would I would have them aim directly at the listener. I mean, you could you could have them like towed towed in uh, or out a little bit, you know, or, or or facing. You could you could be listening at a, like, a different angle, and it will like I guess soften the um, the trouble. But then you're you're getting like uh you're you're just like um listening to a less than the trouble region. So like. For the most neutral response, listen to them on on axis, and if you want a little bit less trouble, yeah, listen to them like 10, 15, 20 degrees off axis. Okay. And I would just say um, I tend to like warmer speakers, so when I set them up, uh, my preference was to do more aggressive toe-in, uh, which means that instead of aiming them at you or point, pointing them straight ahead, I actually point them so they cross the room. So I basically would point them so that they're at the opposite, pointing at the opposite back corner of the room. And the reason I do that is that a, a good speaker like this with constant or, or well-controlled directivity can take advantage of a, a concept known as time intensity trading, uh, where essentially w what it does is minimize sidewall reflections and makes it so that as you as a listener move uh, left or right relative to those speakers, that the tonal balance doesn't and the loudness doesn't shift. Basically, it stays the same. So my own preference was to go ahead and do that. And I did find that they sounded good and worked well in that way. Awesome. Well, guys, that's a good deal. Um, like James was saying, uh, Klipsch is one of the brands that sells online. So they sell on Amazon. You could look like Amazon Prime Day a couple of days ago. They were probably on sale. So it's a very accessible speaker to get. And, you know, most of their products, they, off, they, also, they uh, offer deep discounts on. So I'm glad to see they have a pretty solid product line here. So let's move on now to Paradigm. Now we've done some Paradigm reviews recently, some of the really expensive towers. I think it was the Prestige line. Uh, James, you did that. But we have the, um, the 800Fs here, the Premier line, which is, has a lot of the technology from the more expensive. I think the Prestige was, was like 17 grand a pair for- um, uh, You're thinking of the Personas? I'm sorry, Persona. I get yeah. There's like three lines, right? I think there's four or five. <laughs> like, I haven't, they've yeah. expanded their product line with this new technology, with that you know phase plug driver and stuff. So I'm sorry, guys. I have a lot of speakers on my mind at once. Um. Yeah. Well, the pres uh, okay. I really like actually. Okay. A lot of people. This will shock some people. Okay. I, I reviewed the Persona Five Fs. Those are very nice speakers, right? Really good speakers, they're, like you say, they're seventeen thousand a pair. Um, and I actually like these more. I, okay, I reviewed the the Paradigm Premier eight hundred F. They're two thousand a pair. I like the pre Premiers more than the Personas. I'm not saying that the Premiers are better speakers. They're not, but the cost. Okay, first of all, the, the, they're a lot cheaper. They're so they're more accessible for more people. That's like a really you know that that gives them kudos in my book, and also um, they're actually more neutral. I mean the 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 personas had a kind of like a rise, I guess, in the response, like a uh, I guess you might call a kind of a a, a low Q kind of like elevation at around eight nine 
kilohertz right and so it did make them a little bit bright and i wanted to list them off axis these it does it doesn't matter where you listen to them it's neutral at all angles um so like i think these are like they're more accurate and uh they don't have the dynamic range of the personas but um i don't like i don't need a monstrously loud dynamic that's just my thing right i, I don't listen at really loud levels i mean the personas can get really loud and um so it can the premieres, but not not as much so. So these are very dynamic, very neutral, um, beautiful um, off-axis response. If you look at the the waterfall graphs, um, uh, and look at the the different angles that I measured, right, flat, flat, like ten degrees, ten, twenty degrees, thirty degrees, forty, right. It's I mean you could listen to this at at almost anywhere in the front hemisphere, uh, the front like hemisphere of the speaker, and it's it's a nicely neutral response. I'm going to show you. Here's the graph, guys, and and it only shows when I'm talking. So, uh, this is what James was talking about. You see how linear this response is? It's just very smooth on and off axis. And then here's a 3D version of that. And you can see there's no suckouts like we saw with the B and W speaker. This is just a way more linear speaker. I mean, there's a little like a ripple here at 10k, but is that because of the phase plug? Is that because you're measuring it only at one or two meters and you're not taking the effects of, of the phase plug? Or is that a real measurement anomaly? Uh, um, I I did. I think I measured this at like one meter and two meters. I, th I can't remember exactly, but I think that might have showed up there. I don't think that's because of the... I don't think that's because of the phase plug, but don't, you know, don't, that's, don't take that to the bank. Um, but I like that's so high up in frequency that... The, yeah, it's not really it doesn't really affect anything yeah the reason why i say that is i've seen that in the past with phase plugs on on metal dome tweeters would cause that little ripple at high frequencies but it's it's something that linearizes the driver and prevents ringing so it's it's worth doing that and i don't think it's something that you see when you measure the speaker you know at a further distance um it, it's possible and, and again it's uh it's it, the these like anomalies that occur are so high in frequency there's very little content up there and a lot of people are, can't really hear that high anyway so like, yeah yeah so these are these are pretty speakers what do they they have uh they must have ma uh, neodymium magnet grills right because i don't see any uh, threaded inserts on the front baffle um i i think they're just using i think they're just using like iron magnets um do they have oh, grills? Oh, 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 you, oh, you were talking about the grills. Yeah, the grills, yeah. They're, they're magnetic. Yeah, 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 they're, yeah, they must be using magnetically magnetically adhesive grills, yes. So yeah, th not, those are really nice looking. Not all the speakers, actually the Klipsch ones have them too. I'm just kind of looking. I know, I, I don't think the RBHs, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't think the RBHs have magnetic grills. I think that's one of the only ones that don't. Yeah, the, um, the SVS ones, we'll, we'll discuss later, they don't have magnetic grills. I, I, I can't remember each we <laughs> Yeah. You know, I went through a lot of speakers, these speakers yeah, and all yeah. the speakers and I, I can't remember every single thing about every single speaker, sorry. It's just something worth noting. I mean, I just, you know, when you look at the aesthetics of things, I do like the magnetic grill. I know it adds cost to the product. Now the uh, these speakers, what was the retail on these around two grand? Let me I have the article so we could look it up here. Yeah, uh, I think there were two thousand uh, a pair. Yeah, so we got the sensitivity on them was rated at 89 dB. Again, we could you could reference the review if you want to see um, how accurate Paradigm spec that when James did his measurements on it. It was a while ago since he's done them. So they are they're two grand a pair. Do, do they only offer one finish on them? No, there's three finishes. I think there's that 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 finish that of that picture that's called a, an espresso finish. It's like a, an espresso wood grain or something like that. I think that's really nice. It looks like tasteful and laid back and it has like this wood finish and it's not like a glossy wood finish so it's like it's more tame you know and and then they have a gloss black and a gloss white too nice yeah they look nice they measure great guys these are these are really nice speakers we've been happy with what paradigm's been doing over the last few years i'll, um, I'll be honest gene um if i could say um I, I really like these speakers. Um, I didn't want to send them back, but uh, yeah, I, I actually compared these to some other speakers that are very, very well, you know, highly regarded. That all measured really, really well, you know. And um, I don't want to say what, but these were not. 
I, they were like indistinguishable from some other speakers that I compare them to that have like almost like picture perfect measurements. So like um, they're like I think these are like I don't hear enough in, in my opinion I don't hear enough like buzz about them. You know I I don't I don't think they're getting enough uh l let's say uh like uh, discussion. You know because they're yeah. so good. these are really good speakers and they don't they're not really that expensive and uh, like I I. I I hear a lot more talk about speakers that well are just not nearly as good, you know. So like, th these need more. Um, they need to be talked about more. Is what I'm saying. Well, we are doing that right now, my friend. So before we move on, why do they have a shower cap on on the uh, mid range? Maybe you could go over that. What's the point of this? It looks like a shower head. Like I'm going to go and uh, get a massage shower or something like that. What's that all about? Okay, that's uh. uh it, it's not quite a grill. It's like this covering. If you get, if you can go to that picture, that's like a close up of them. You'll see this almost like a sunflower see. pattern on them. This like kind of like a this geometric pattern on there them. There we go. Here, if you want to look at this real quick, guys, this is why it just reminds me of like a shower head. You know, like I have one that has all the different settings that do the different vibrations. It's kind of a joke, but I know that there's purpose to this. So I'm going to let you discuss it. Here's the picture of it, and go ahead. Okay. Okay. So the purpose of that, if you'll notice on that picture, the on the outer like edges, the, there's like it, it's a perforated like grill type piece on the outer edges. The perforation, the holes are bigger, and as you go inward, they're smaller. So, so this function is sort of like a phase plug, and that like um, uh, the different like areas of the driver will kind of like uh, will like interfere with each other you know they'll, they'll like bounce bounce back at each other and interfere with each other like um like so like one end of the driver will like will cause sound to go in a, in a direction that interferes with another edge of the driver and so like these prevent the sound that's being emitted from the cone to like uh collide with each other and it causes these interference patterns which can cause this, this something called comb filtering and so like um this prevents that um i don't honestly i, I I don't know how well it really works. Um, I, I've seen the patent for it, and they have drawings of this uh, efficient, you know, its uh, effectiveness on the patent, and like um, it seems to be doing something. I don't, I don't really, I don't think it's like a ma doing something that's like major, but I think it's it's pretty and it's distinctive, and for that, I think it's cool. Now, let me ask you this, because I'm just thinking, usually when something is cool like that, and if stuff, if stuff is made overseas, you know the Chinese are going to copy it, and you're going to see it in other, in other products. But in this case, are these, made, are these made in Canada, or are these made overseas? Those are manufactured in Canada, I believe. And I, and I think out of all the speakers in this group, correct me if I'm wrong, these are the only ones that are not manufactured overseas? I believe so. Yeah, I I, th I think that's the case. Okay, that's well, it's worth noting, especially now we're dealing with the the tariff issue. Um, I'm not even sure how Canada would be affected by that, or at least right now, I don't think it is. But it is worth noting that Paradigm, because um, this is their higher end stuff, that they do manufacture it in Canada. They're not doing these overseas like some of the lower end stuff is. Uh, Gene, and real quick, just so you know, you're still sharing your screen, so we're seeing, we're not seeing you talk. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna do that a little longer because I want to show the measurements for the the next couple of speakers, and people already know what I look like. I'm sure they're sick of it by now. <laughs> so, so, anyways, moving on, let's go to the RBH R55Es from their impression line. This is an interesting speaker because about maybe eight to 10 years ago, I reviewed the first impression line um, when they were trying to do internet direct through a brand called EMP. And for the money, they were really good speakers. There were seven or eight, nine hundred dollars a pair. But what I found that they lacked was bass response. The drivers, the woofers, they didn't have a lot of uh, excursion capability. So they didn't really play useful bass below maybe 40 or 50 hertz. But I liked how dynamic they were because they had two mid-range drivers. I like—I really like, I, I guess my bias is I like speakers with MTM uh, driver topologies just because if you listen to music with a lot of brass instruments or a lot of jazz music, just that extra surface area I think really makes a difference 
and, and just how it plays into the room, you know, having an MTM like this kind of controls the vertical dispersion. I just, I like the way an MTM sounds. So that speaker had a lot of good merits to it, but it lacked bass. And if you didn't mate it with a subwoofer, it was somewhat unsatisfying, at least for me. So I kept bugging RBH for years. Hey, you guys need to put, you know, more performance drivers into these speakers, even if you have to raise the price. Um, I think it's worth doing, especially if you're going to be selling this stuff online. And Shane Rich is a brilliant designer from RBH, has been there forever. And he listens. And sure enough, a few years later, they came out with this tower. They've got two different versions of this tower. This is the high performance version. And then they have one that's a little less money that uses different drivers that don't have the aluminum drivers here. But this speaker, I got to listen to these a little bit before they sent them to you to measure, James. And let me tell you, for an impression line, this is a completely different speaker. This thing had a lot of bass, almost too much bass. Um, not in a bad way, but it, it had really deep bass. I wasn't expecting to hear that. And I thought the speaker was a, had a bit of a bite to it, whereas the older one, the tweeter, was too laid back. So he, they definitely designed the speaker to be more in your face than the, la, than the uh, ones it replaces. want to go over with you what your impressions were of the speaker. Let's show some measurements before we do that. And I'm going to show you guys the graphs. And you know it a little bit. There, it, there seems to be a little rise in the mid-range here. And I'll let you talk about that um, after people kind of digest what this looks like. But there's no obvious suck outs like we saw with, you know, with the BMW speaker. So I think the response looks pretty decent. And here's a 3D view of it. And off axis looks pretty smooth as well. So James, why don't you comment on this? And I don't know if Matt, heard, Matt, you didn't hear the speaker, right? No, I never heard the speaker. I saw the measurements and uh, James and I talked about them a bit because of that, that boost in the presence region. But I actually didn't get a chance to hear them. Okay, so James, why don't you give your impression of the speaker? Um, tell us what you thought about it, what your recommendation for setup is on it, if you remember, and you know how you thought it compared to the other speakers that you were reviewing. Um, well, I like them. Uh, it, it, this is quite a while ago, so I'm trying to remember. Uh, yeah, th they sounded really good. Um, there is that, uh, they do have a, a kind of voicing they're not the most neutral speaker they're not not really non-neutral by that i mean they're not that like they're not really inaccurate they're just um they have that uh this mid-range rise there it's definitely audible and it's not that it's not like that bad i prefer a flat response myself but this isn't really that bad um and like i think it's good for people who want like uh maybe a little bit more ex, uh, like uh, emphasis on dialogue, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, certain instruments. So like it, it gives it, it doesn't, it gives it a non-neutral, it, it definitely doesn't have the most, it's not the most tonally balanced speaker, but it's pretty balanced overall. It has good directivity control too. I mean, the uh, off axis response resembles the on axis response pretty good, right? So it's a good speaker overall, you know, and it, this like, yeah, yeah, it's voice, but the voicing isn't. It doesn't take it that far from like neutrality. Okay, so like um, and and the two the like as you say the two mid range drivers um. Well, it it, it should give it more like dynamic range in, in that region and like, so like uh. I didn't I didn't push it so hard that I ever pressed it like where I could even tell the difference between that or a normal like three way tower. It's like I don't listen to things that loud. I'm trying to preserve my hearing. So like um uh it's it's just a good speaker. It's a good well-rounded speaker. I I don't know what to say about it. It's like it's also very pretty and like I think most people would think like like okay, this is what 2000 a pair I think for like the elite edition with the gloss black finish right. Right. But 2000 that's a lot of speaker. Okay? So that's like a they look a lot more expensive than they are. I mean, if I saw these at like a trade show or something, I would say, oh, that's got to be like 5,000 a pair or something like that. I wouldn't guess that these are um, 2,000 a pair. And like, so it's a, it's a really, it's a good bargain for some, it looks like a luxury speaker, really. It looks, it, it looks high end. It really does. I love the outriggers. If you see on my screen right now, you know, a lot, most of the speakers, they either give you spikes or they put a bass plinth on it to stabilize it. 
I think this is a kind of a better approach because the the the, the uh, planets kind of look too boxy when you put those on, but this kind of looks more classy. This gives you the stability of like a planet because it puts out the um, it puts out the um, spikes a little further than the cabinet width, so it adds stability, so you can't tip the speaker over easily. And then of course you have the ability to spike or use cones, so you get better uh, coupling to the floor. So I really like that outrigger system. I think it's one of the better ones out of the one, any of them I've seen in the industry. I'll give like outrigger is like um, okay. So you you had the plinths on the Bowers and Wilkins speakers. Well, outrigger is what they kind of do for me is like they make it seem like the speaker isn't taking up as much like floor space as it really does. You know. Yep. Yep. So it, it gives it like a, almost like a. I mean, it does take up that much room, but it, like it makes it seem, I guess, like a, a little bit more higher end or something like that, you know? It's more, yeah, it's somewhat of an optical illusion. It looks less bulky, you know, just by seeing it like that. It looks less bulky. And I think they did a good job with that. The only negative cosmetically, I say, is that they don't have the magnetic grills. But I'd imagine that would add some significant cost to the speaker, especially since it's got such a huge, vertically long baffle. I mean, look, it's got, it's the only speaker in the bunch that has six drivers in it. So it's, it's physically, I, it's a longer speaker than most of the other ones in the roundup, right? Yeah. It's like, it's, if I recall correctly, it really does have to be the, like the tallest speaker, at least it's, um, it's a big speaker, but like, I, like we say, it's a lot of speaker for the money. I mean, I, I really like these speakers. They can, they can like, they can jam, they sound great. They look great. Uh, you can't really go wrong with them. I guess if you wanted something that was like purely like totally like perfect, right? Th there are like better choices out there, but most people would just like, you know, they would just love them. So like, you know. Yeah, yeah they are. I just looked at the specs on your article. They're 47 inches tall, whereas the other ones are between 41 and 43 inches. So, you know, they're, they're about four or five inches taller than, than the other speakers in this roundup. Oh, one thing, Gene. Um, I would say, if I remember right, the the tweeter was kind of high on those. Yeah. So like, that's a that's something. I don't know. It's not really a big deal, but like, if you if you're seated really low, these might not be the greatest choice, you know, because the tweeter is so high, and you generally for speakers you want to listen on on the with your ears on level with the tweeter. So there is that, but I think most people, it's not a concern. I gotcha. Well, I mean, they're nice speakers, guys. RBH has been making some great speakers for a long time. I use a bunch of them in my reference system. I just, I like the way they voice their stuff personally. I do like a little bit of a forward mid-range, which you, you do get with the MTM kind of design on how they did this. Um, but you always have tone controls if you need to tone that down. The same thing with the, the clips, if you think that's a little bright or whatever. It's always better to, to have to take away than to add, I think. So... The last speaker in this roundup is the SVS Prime Pinnacle. And that's a new speaker that literally came out, I think, like a few weeks ago. It hasn't been out that long. Um, I think it was like a couple months ago that was launched, but it, it is a new speaker. It's SVS's latest like uh, product. Um, we have a pair in front of us right now. Um, and uh, they're like, they're a solid speaker. I really like them. Uh, I, I don't um wait wait what can you really say about them? I think one thing that makes them really distinctive is the really uh unique bass driver loading. Okay, so like all the other speakers, um they just put the bass drivers in the cabinet and they and they put and, and the, all the bass drivers share the entire cabinet. Okay. So they they all have like the the, the most like internal area. But these um each each base driver there's three base drivers there's six and a halfs and uh they're each given their own separate enclosure so they're they're like cut off from each other within the cabinet and they're each given their own port too and the ports have different tuning frequencies so this is a it's not, not something i've seen before i've heard about kind of designs like this but i've never seen it before and um what it does is it gives you a lot of like uh freedom to control the bass response exactly how you want it and like, um, so it's a unique speaker and it sounds really good. Well, I, I have a picture uh, put up here on 
on the actual review, I clicked on it so you could see what James is talking about. You could see that each of these cavities are their own container, basically, for the drivers. Uh, that also adds rigidity to the cabinet because those act as braces, right? Yeah, that's correct. Um, so the, the, they're they're not just like compartmentalizing the base drivers; um, they're they're acting as like uh, you know braces, like like full braces, not even window braces. And also the uh, the mid range driver at the very top is um, has its own sealed off compartment too. So it's it's a sealed compartment. It has its own thing and. Uh, Right. Yeah. Well, I, I did see one other speaker company do this first. I think it was PSB with their T8 model, or I, I don't remember their model numbers, but I remember a few years ago when PSB announced one of their flagship speakers, they were doing something like this. And I thought to myself, it sounds cool, but at the same time, you are sacrificing um, internal volume for those drivers. So I'm just wondering if they're reducing the low end extension by doing this, but at the same time, you're also getting better tuning options to load it into the room better. So maybe it's a worthy trade-off. Well, it, and uh, one of the things that sort of changed over time that's allowed this to be less of a trade-off is that we've gotten to a point now where we can do a better job designing drivers for, for particular purposes. And SVS actually has access to uh, custom drivers uh, to meet their needs. And so what they can do is design the driver to work in a smaller cabinet, and then that allows them to do the lower tuning. Now, the problem with small cabinets is that ports nece necessarily have to become longer for a given diameter when the enclosure is smaller. So that, that can still be an issue. But, uh, you know, I wanted to comment on this so people kind of understand the way to picture this in your brain is that the response of a port, because it's a resonant device, is that it looks a lot like a parametric EQ filter. It looks like a hill, basically. And the center of the hill is the tuning frequency. Uh, so if you shift the tuning frequency of the three ports from each other by a little bit, let's say a quarter of an octave, uh, then what happens is that the total response, the summed response of the three ports, ends up having a much lower Q, a wider bandwidth, uh, that's covered by those three ports than would happen if you just had the one port. So the advantage is that the port can then become kind of almost more like a driver and that you're extending the range in which it's boosting by quite a bit. It can be by as much as half an octave. Oh, interesting. Okay. Awesome. So let's look at how this measured. I, we forgot to go over the measurements. Let me uh, pull up the graphs here. So this, James, this is interesting. I mean, it's smooth, but it looks like you don't have as much uh, off-axis response here, right? It looks like it's tapered off more at the higher uh, angles when you look at the 3D plot especially. Is this, is this just, uh, you know, a more tightly controlled dispersion on the on the top end for the speaker? What What's going on here? I, I think one aspect of that is um, that the tweeter, if you'll note, it's a little. It's a voice a little bit lower in level than the mid range and the bass drivers. So like, the tweeter is a, a, the highs are a little bit res recessed on the speakers. It's not a bright speaker. This is kind of laid back, you might say, and so like um, that accounts partly for like the uh, like like the the off axis roll off of the of the tweeter, and um, I think that's probably mostly actually. That's probably mo that counts mostly for that. The tweet is just not as high in level as the other drivers, and so like maybe if it had been voiced louder, you would see um, you'd see uh, more off-axis energy. But um, yeah, so that's just the way the speaker is. It's not it's not a bright speaker. So it's a more laid-back sound than some of the other ones in this group, is what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that was. Uh... I actually have not loved the sound of SBS speakers in the past because they tend to be bright. And James told me that these were not. When we listened, we did find them to be warmer. I, I'll also mention, though, when you look at that graph, I think that you're also seeing something else, which is the stark contrast in dispersion between the very wide dispersion woofer and mid-range and the more normal dispersion of the tweeter. While it's a, maybe a little more narrow than some dome tweeters, that actually is in line with what you typically would see. It's just that the speaker's response doesn't change much at all as you move off axis in the mid-range and bass frequencies. Oh, so that's actually a good thing. I mean, that they were able to do that with the mid-range, right? Uh, normally, you'd want the all, all drivers to have matching directivity. I, don't, I wouldn't call it a good thing or a bad thing. I would say it's just a matter of this speaker's voicing. I mean, mm -hmm. if you want, if, if even this, like, this recessed 
like travel level is a little bit much for you. You can just listen off axis at like 20 degrees or even like 15. And like, it's just for like a warmer sound, right? So like there's advantages to this kind of voicing. You could just like change the angle of the, that, of the speaker that you're listening to and like, um, just, just, and it just like uh, cuts off a bit of the trouble. And so like, you know, for some, I, I, honestly, I wish speakers that were brighter would have this quality, you know? So these gotcha. speakers, didn't really need that. It's not bad. You you want to listen to these speakers right on axis. So you want these aimed right at you because like um, that's where you get the most linear response and and the most trouble. And these are already kind of laid back and warm. So like I don't see why you'd want to listen to these like off axis too much unless you're really sensitive to trouble. And some people are. And these would be a good choice for for people who like uh, get like listening fatigue from like bright speakers or speakers that have a little bit too much trouble energy. These are a great choice, and like I can just sit there and listen to these all day. They just they sound just fine to me. Right, that's great. Two other things I like to point out on this speaker. I have the picture up here. Uh, SVS put the mid range driver above the tweeter, and I guess they did this because they wanted that tweeter to be at ear level, since it's kind of a taller speaker. Uh, unless you think there's another reason why, because it's not an MTM. Obviously, that's a dedicated mid range driver, and those bass drivers are dedicated bass drivers. Um, regarding the height of the tweeter, yeah, I mean, if they put the tweeter above the mid-range driver, it would be a bit high, I think, for a lot of seating positions. Um, I don't think it would make too much of a difference unless you listened low. Um, acoustically, there's no real reason not to put it below the mid-range, or, or, or like where it is. I mean, there's, it, it's about where it should be. I, I don't think there's too much, too big of a difference if you had it below or above the mid-range. Okay. Well, this is another of the two speakers out of the five that doesn't have the magnetic grills. Uh, the other thing I, I, I noted when I was looking at the review, I got to see if I could pull this up still. Uh, I don't know if I have that window open anymore. Um, yeah, here it is. Oh, I had to add it open. So this is not a bi ampable or bi wireable speaker. And we didn't really talk about this with the other designs. And I don't know how good your memory is. But um, I'm assuming a lot of speakers in this price range are not by ampable or by wireable. Is that a good assumption? Like the paradigms, the RBHs. Um, I guess we got to go back and kind of look, or if you remember. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't. I don't remember. I I know that. See, the paradigms were by ampable. The Bowers and Wilkins were. The Clips were. I don't think the RBHs were, but I don't remember. There's a picture on the. You can see the picture on the review. I think there's a picture. Actually, I didn't write the review for the RBH speakers. T Steve Feinstein did. Oh, yeah, you did the measurements on them. Yeah, I just did the measurements on those. Steve did a great job with the review, too. Uh, I'm looking so at the RBH now. They're not by wireable or by ampable. I have the picture here. It's just a single uh, terminal there. Um, it's not a huge deal. It's just something I'm noting. I know some people like to play around with amplifiers and stuff, and it's just something worth noting that not all of these have the same uh, wiring capability if you want to play with cables. The clips are bi wireable and bi ampable, I think. I see the jumpers here. So, yeah, they're bi ampable. Yeah, I, I would say that it's not, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's worth doing it for speakers at this price point, right? Yeah. There's no, there's no real good advantage. I think if you had like, like really high powered speakers, then yeah, there's there's advantages there, but for like consumer audio, for normal consumer audio speakers, and like for like a regular room in a normal domestic situation, there's no, it's it's like worse than it. There's like, I would say, um, how how should I phrase this? It's it's like it's more of a source of problems than it will be for benefits. So yeah. more people will end up screwing this up than they will like doing everything just right, and so it's it's a liability. It it shouldn't be there for speakers like these. Yeah, we're not big proponents of bi wiring. I mean, I I just assume use one single cable that has lower gauge, you know, lower resistance, and just be done with it. I mean, if you if you got two pairs of cables laying around, I guess you could parallel them up and and bi wire to your heart's content. But and then the bi ampable stuff. Most people hooking these speakers up are doing it to an AVR, and they're probably using bass management, and they probably have powered subs. So the whole bi amping thing for a tower like this, when especially when it's going in a home theater environment doesn't make a lot of sense. 
Yeah, I mean, there are some receivers that let you use the extra outputs as for biamping purposes. And so you might get an extra between one and maybe as much as three decibels output, but it's unlikely. And to me, it just seems like a waste of resources. I also think, like James mentioned, that the risk of screwing things up is greater than any acoustic benefit you would get out of it. You know, there's kind of going back to some stuff we mentioned in the active speaker video, there's a lot of myths around the benefit of, of actively biamping speakers that aren't true. One of the arguments is that it reduces intermodulation distortion. The problem is it only does that in the amplifier and it's going to have inaudible uh, intermodulation distortion anyway. So there's not really a benefit. <laughs> yeah. And guys, be careful with the bi amp feature of your AV receivers, especially in the day of, of Atmos when they're cramming nine or 11 channels into a chassis that shouldn't have more than seven channels in it. So the power supplies are not big enough and you're really not getting a whole lot of benefit. In fact, if your receiver weighs under 40 pounds, don't even use the bi amp feature. I'm just going to make a rule of thumb to be safe, use those extra channels for another zone or something, and just use two channels of amplification for your for your tower, your main speakers, or use an external amp if you have preamp outputs and you want more power. So well, I'm, I'm going to go over. Um, I think we wrap this up. Um, unless you, James, do you, do you have anything else you want to say about these speakers? Um, I I just wanted to say one thing about um, biamping, like the biampable speaker terminals and the speakers you know I've, I've read it in like in our forums people some sometimes sometimes come to us with like you know, what what's wrong with the system you know or, you know and, and a lot of times there's no base or there's no trouble or something and uh, we, and we'll say well are the jumpers there between the the biampable speaker terminals and like what are those you know and that's that's like that can be the source of a problem people don't realize those jumpers have to like uh you know get those circuits together or else you have like you know you're just you have no uh your either the woofers will be cut off and won't be getting any um energy or the mid the tweeter and mid range will be cut off so like yeah there's like it's it's a source for problems it's it's more of a source for for confusion for people and like that's that's something we've seen in the past yeah good point i i don't watch the forums sometimes as closely as you do i guess people are taking the jumpers off thinking they're doing a good thing and they're actually not so Keep that in mind. If you don't have bass, make sure you have all your connections together first before you start complaining about the speaker. So I want to go over some of these questions here. I'm just kind of sifting through them. Uh, one person said, Andrew Jones said that he would keep comp he compromised speaker efficiency to get better lower range response in an interview with Steve Gutenberg. Yeah, and I've seen a lot of speakers do that where they've compromised sensitivity to get lower end extension. There's pros and cons to that. I've seen I don't think it's a great idea with bookshelf speakers. There was a, a particular bookshelf speaker years ago. Everybody was touting that it had the greatest low end response. It was a five and a quarter inch two way. I got them in here and yeah, they did have good bass down to the 35 Hertz or so, but they would bottom out with anything above 70 dB at the listening area in my 6,000 cubic foot room. So just keep that in mind when you're dealing with a budget type of speaker that has limited output capability. If you, if you, trade efficiency for a base extension. I don't think that's a good idea, especially when you have powered subwoofers and they're so cheap today. I'd rather have the dynamic range in the speaker and, and cut it off in base management and use one or two subwoofers. Yeah, I would totally agree with you on that. I actually happen to not agree with that design choice. Um, it's done quite a bit. I think in the two channel days when subwoofers were uncommon, there was an argument for it, at least in some cases. But I think today with subwoofers and the fact that a lot of these are going into mixed use or, or even just full on surround systems, it's, it's not a great option because you lose so much output. And there are even some speakers out there. We tested, uh, James and I each had reviewed separately this uh, Dayton audio speaker. It's a bookshelf. It's inexpensive sounded decent enough but one of the things they did was they significantly compromised uh uh sensitivity for bass output so that speaker actually i think i measured it below 80 dbs one watt one meter and i think you were like right around 80 dbs one watt one meter maybe you also were below 80 uh also they could get a, a basically what was it a four inch woofer down to 40 hertz to me that was the wrong choice in the end well, you know, it's it's not that bad if you're using them as like a desktop speaker where it's going to be really close to you. Yeah. But obviously, a speaker like that, we're talking about the the Dayton Audio MK four hundred twos. Um. The the sensitivity of the low, very low sensitivity liability, it can be, but it doesn't have to be. It depends on how you use it. 
you know, amplification is cheap nowadays. And if you're not listening, if you're not listening to the speakers too far, then they're going to have like all the output that most people would want. You know, it, like like say like a desktop speaker or like like a near like a dorm speaker or something. You know, something as long as you're not you don't expect high output, they're fine. You know. Yeah. yeah. Although I do I do want to say amplification may be cheap, but uh, for the most part, a reduction in sensitivity will always uh, lead to a reduction in maximum output because. Uh, in for two different reasons, our amplifier power typically is fixed. One is that most people are using a receiver and that would fix it. The other is that most speakers are limited in their maximum power handling. Um, mm -hmm. and so as soon as you start to go from like 86 to 83 decibels, uh, sensitivity, one watt, one meter, you automatically need twice the power. But if the two speakers handle the same power, you have just lost three decibels of maximum output instead. By the way, stop saying one watt. Say two point eight three volts, please. Sorry, you're right. Two point eight three volts. That is <laughs> We're getting away from that one watt rating because that's a, un, you know it's got to compare apples to apples all the time, regardless yeah. of the impedance of the speaker. So, a um, couple more questions here. Uh, seems silly that SVS has the lowest frequency response. Who found out about SVS and buys their towers without owning their subs? Well, I think SVS designed that tower thinking a lot of people would use it for two channel applications. So, I mean, if, if you could afford to put base into a tower, then, you know, it's not a bad thing. You could always still base manage that tower and still have great integration with your subs, maybe cross your subs over a little bit lower instead of crossing them over at 80 Hertz, you cross them over at 60 Hertz or something like that. Um, I think there's definitely a good advantage to have base capable towers, even if you're not using them all the way down to 20 Hertz. And you're yeah, not compromising sensitivity. Yeah, and, and James and I listened to these as a two-channel, actually just before we did this video, so I had a chance to hear them uh, with no subwoofer. He kept saying to me over and over again, no subwoofers, don't hook up any subwoofers, because he knows me, I always will otherwise. And they they did have an impressive amount of bass. I played a bunch of different music to get a sense of that. And, and I think for a lot of people who are not necessarily using them with movies and just listening to music would find them to be more than adequate. Yep. Just looking through some of the other comments here. I saw a comment earlier that I think is maybe worth addressing. Somebody had asked if we review speakers um, in two different scenarios for home theater and two channel and then measure for each. And the reason why I think that's worth talking about is I think all three of us probably have an opinion about this, but uh, my view is that a good speaker is a good speaker, that you don't make a good speaker for home theater and a different good speaker for two channel that if a speaker is designed right, it's good for either. And from a measurement standpoint, that means that there's really only one set of measurements you use, and it tells you what you need to know for both home theater and two channel. But when we review, we do, of course, use a mixture of movies and music. I know, James, you tend to do that, at least to some extent. I usually do that unless the speaker really is compromised for home theater. And the compromise for home theater, in some ways, can also be a compromise for music, and that's that it's usually too dynamically limited. Um, I like. I don't really see too much of a difference between music and movies because, like, a lot of mo movies have uh, lots of music in them. So, like, you want that music to sound good. And also, I, I guess one argument I hear a lot is that, well, a speaker for movies should be have more dynamic range. Well, the thing is, movies, they don't have sound going on all the time. A lot of it's just, like, dialogue, right? And dialogue isn't, like, pushing your speakers to their, their like, limits, right? But a lot of music is a very constant, um, a higher... Uh, level of like uh, you know the higher signal right it's 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 there's more going on all the time and and if you look at like the the energy like uh the the sound energy um of a music versus like a movie scene or well, the music is probably going to be higher a lot higher unless unless you're talking about well it's like in the middle of an action scene for like a modern action movie you know aside from that uh, m music tends to like uh. I, I think music is like a higher, um, it's a more demanding application for like like a, you know, um, dynamic range and like uh, so like I don't I don't really see the difference between the two. Yeah, and to be honest with you, and my opinion on that is, it's pretty easy to get speakers to sound good for home theater because you got lots of speakers playing in the room, and once you have lots of speakers playing in the room, the sound mediocre sound becomes more forgiving. But to sit down with just a pair of speakers and two channel listening to music, it's it's you're far more critical of those speakers. So if they sound good for two channel music, they're going to sound good for home theater. 
But when something sounds decent for home theater, it may not necessarily sound good when you're just playing music in two channel. So that's just kind of how I approach things. I always look for the musicality of the speaker above all else. Yeah, that, that's like, that's a very like sensible like um, approach, definitely. Uh, to, I mean, like uh, when you when you bring a whole lot of speakers in the mix, they can like mask each other's flaws because they're not often the same design, or that you know, and also in a, like a surround sound, there's like a, a little lot of process sound, and like you can't really tell much from how a speaker. Uh, sounds like like for for example a two channel like let's say you're listening to like a two channel direct like orchestral recording okay um there's probably not gonna be a whole lot of processing in that sound you know and uh but now let's say you, you're listening to like an action movie that has like an atmos surround you know sound mix like how are you how do you know what that's supposed to sound like versus what you're hearing you know so like it, it could sound like anything. You wouldn't know the difference unless you were the, uh, the sound engineer, you know? So like, uh, but you can kind of tell what things are supposed to sound like with just like two channels and like a, like a good acoustic recording. Right. Yep. And I think another issue to think about too, is from a review standpoint, it's rare that we're sent an entire uh, matching home theater setup. So if you, if you just replace basically your left and right speaker with the review speakers, uh, with a movie, because sound is coming from all the other speakers, it becomes also hard to tell what is the difference that this speaker under review is making versus everything else in the room and how it blends together. Yeah, agreed. Unless we're doing a five channel or seven channel speaker system from the same series of products, we tend to focus more on the two channel aspects of the speakers we're, we're reviewing. Um, someone's asking, what do you think about the JBL L100 Classics? I, I got a chance to hear those at, at the Expona show in Florida. Um, a few months ago. I thought they sounded really great. Um, I didn't expect them not to sound good because they have excellent driver transducers and they have the new wave gun on their tweeter. I just think their grill covers are ridiculous with that uh, waffle cone uh, grill cover, that orange foamy, very lossy grill cover. I'd love to actually have James measure those because I'm telling you, that's one example where a grill cover is doing the speaker no favors. But that said, if I had a pair of speakers like that, I would definitely use them without the grills because I love those big white 12 inch woofers. I just think they look awesome. So yeah, good speaker. Uh, JBL makes really solid products. The other thing to note too, guys, is this is just five speakers that we reviewed uh, for this year. There are so many good speakers at 2000 a pair. Um, obviously we're not covering all of them. But if I have my way, I will have James cover probably another four or five in the next six months, and then maybe we'll come back here and do another video. We're also doing a, we're gonna be doing a budget video in the coming weeks on, they were all bookshelf speakers. No, they were towers, right? For two, under 200 a pair that you reviewed that we're gonna do like a little shootout of. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I recently we reviewed a couple of really affordable, really inexpensive tower speakers. And like, yeah, we could uh, we could talk about those. Um, I think they're both very interesting speakers. One thing I think uh, makes these speakers more interesting than others is that in, in a really low budget design, it's it's just nothing but compromises, you know, from a, from a manufacturing standpoint. So like, you have to figure out what you want to give up, what you want to focus on as a designer. And so like, they both these speakers, they're, they're uh, uh, mono price MP. Um, T65RT and the Dayton Audio MK442Ts, which is like the tower speaker version of the, the bookshelf speaker that we were just discussing. They both have very interesting attributes to them. They're they're definitely worth talking about. Um, I'm looking forward to that discussion. That'll be really cool. Awesome. Yeah, guys, we're going to be doing a lot more speaker stuff here. Um, hopefully, we'll get James back and we'll have Matt as well. Give us some ideas on what you want to see reviewed in the coming months. Um, I think just to let the cat out of the bag a little bit, you're going to be reviewing some new Rebel speakers in the, in the coming months too, right, James? Gene, you're spoiling it. Oh, I got to gotta, gotta tease them. I got to tease them. Yeah, we, we're going to review some Rebel speakers. I don't know if you want me to say what model exactly, but... No, nah, no, nah, don't give them too much. Don't give them too much info. Okay, yeah, it's going to be cool. That's all I can say. It's It's going to be cool. We also have, we're going to have some uh, Martin Logans coming in. We've got, geez, I don't even remember all the speakers we got. We got you busy, James. We got you really busy in the coming months. So I hope you enjoy being on camera. I know it's your first time. 
And um, hopefully you'll you'll like it more and more and you'll just keep coming back and you'll give our audience uh, your viewpoints on what you've listened to, how they measured. I think the setup tips are really useful, just telling people how they should tow the speaker in or to get the most neutral response or whether they shouldn't tow it in. And just, you know, giving general guidelines on how to get the most out of these speakers. Because let's face it, you guys are spending a lot of money. Two grand a pair is not chump change. That's that's a good chunk of earnings. And you want to make sure you get the most out of that speaker uh, and let, let it live up to its full potential. So I think we are done. Matt, thanks for being here. James, thanks for being here. And oh, uh, yeah, it was fun. Guys, uh, if you like this video, please thumb it up. Please join our Patreon at patreon.com slash audioholics. You can go in there and you can request very specific view top review topics you want us to do. Um, you get content on that channel before you often get it live here. I, I, I leave some of the stuff private here and, and on the Audioholics website, and I release it on Patreon, you know, sometimes days or weeks before it goes live publicly. So there's some advantages there. And hey, if you become a really good sponsor of our Patreon, one of the top tier levels, we'll even feature you as a guest and we'll put your home theater on our channel if you if you want to do that. There's just a lot of cool stuff that, that's going on behind the scenes with Audio Hawks we want you guys to be a part of. Appreciate everybody spending, God, we were on here for like an hour and a half. This was a long broadcast. And I think I have a pizza waiting for me downstairs that I want to go and digest because I'm like thinking about food right now. So anyways, guys, thanks for listening. And my friends, until next time, keep listening and listen well.